last time we were really talking about uh, goodness what is goodness and uh, we said that uh, to be good is mainly to be unselfish because we normally uh, the mind is a narrow mind and our aim is to broaden the mind and uh, so the broad mind is the good mind and the narrow mind is the bad mind so that is what we normally see as good and bad and uh, it is good because it brings happiness to everyone not only happiness to oneself but happiness to all so it's not a self selfish happiness it's a happiness for all so uh, and we also pointed out that that happiness is not an excitement but a calm tranquil peaceful state of mind and uh, what normally people call happiness is pleasure now we have to distinguish between pleasure and happiness pleasure is stimulating the senses if you see beautiful things that is pleasure if you listen to a pleasant music that is pleasure if you smell pleasant perfumes that is pleasure if you taste pleasant food that is pleasure and if you experience pleasant touches that is pleasure so pleasure is all stimulating the senses that is we are referring to the pleasant sensation there are three kinds of sensations pleasant unpleasant and the neutral so it is the pleasant sensation that people call happiness but that is not the happiness that buddha called happiness because the pleasant sensation can also make you unhappy the pleasant sensation makes you unhappy when it is not there and you want it you want the pleasant sensation but it is not there then you are unhappy as a result when the pleasant sensation is there you become happy in the same way when the unpleasant sensation is present you are unhappy when the un- unpleasant sensation is absent you are happy so you get happiness from both pleasant as well as unpleasant sensations so and you get pain from both pleasant as well as unpleasant sensations so the real happiness is when you don't have the desire for the pleasant sensation and if you don't have the hatred for the unpleasant sensation 
then you can be happy. So happiness is not a sensation. Happiness is a state of mind. Happiness is a state of mind which is not disturbed by pleasure or pain. So happiness is a state of mind. So this is why the Buddha speaks of the disadvantages Kamanang o Adinamang o Karang Sankilesa. These three words are very important about pleasure. Adinava means that. Uh, Pleasures are disadvantages, that it doesn't bring you real happiness. Pleasure only develops a desire for it. Pleasure makes you desire the pleasure and then it goes away. It is like showing a chocolate to a child and taking it away. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, it makes you desire it and then it goes away, then you become unhappy. So, pleasure is not an advantage to go after pleasures. And uh, okarang means that it is futile. It doesn't bring you satisfaction. So pleasure doesn't really bring you satisfaction. You only makes you unhappy. Sankile sank means uh, it takes you away from the truth, it misleads you. You are not able to see, you are, you are not able to think properly. It can prevent you from thinking properly. So it can be a hindrance as a result. So seeking pleasure becomes a hindrance. It hinders your progress. And then the Buddha speaks about the advantages of giving up pleasures. If you give up pleasures, that means you don't go after pleasures. And instead of that, you begin to purify the mind. And if you begin to purify the mind, that purity of mind brings happiness. So that purity of mind is the important thing. So instead of going after pleasures, we should learn to purify the mind. And by purifying the mind, we become happy as a result. Hmm? And uh, the method of purifying the mind is what we call meditation. So meditation is learning to purify the mind. 
and meditation is not concentration this is the biggest mistake that people do today they think meditation is concentration you cannot purify the mind by trying to concentrate because concentration is like uh, what is called a tug of war you know what that is huh? some people pull in one direction the other people pull in the other direction so the mind goes in two directions and uh, the mind is in a tug of war and that is what it means that uh, is a very cumbersome act trying to concentrate so when you begin to concentrate Oh, these are some things written yesterday. Huh? No, this was not written today. Yeah. So the important thing is that uh, when you begin to concentrate, what happens? What is it that happens when you begin to concentrate? Some people. work very hard at trying to concentrate and when that happens your mind gets tired when you begin to concentrate your mind gets tired and when the mind gets tired what happens it goes to sleep so the mind goes to sleep so while you are trying to concentrate your mind goes to sleep and when the mind goes to sleep what happens you begin to dream now when you are trying to concentrate you are not uh, lying down no you are either sitting or standing you are trying to concentrate and when the mind goes to sleep when you are standing what happens <laughs> you enter a state which is midway between waking and sleeping that state which is midway between waking and sleeping is what is called the hypnotic state so that is the hypnotic state you enter the hypnotic state and in the hypnotic state you begin to dream and that dream is like sleep walking you know you have heard of that huh so it's more like sleep walking so you are in a different world but you are in a dream so that sometimes that can be used for a medical purposes by now they they speak of entering the subconscious mind or something like that and what they do is they can put in information into the mind or take away information from the mind and uh, that kind of thing can be done in that hypnotic state but some people think that meditation is entering the hypnotic state meditation is not entering the hypnotic state 
Meditation is something completely different from this. So hypnosis and meditation are two different things. The, in the hypnotic state, you are unconscious. In meditation, you are conscious. That's the difference. But while in the hypnotic state, you may think you are conscious, but you are not conscious. But in the meditation state, you are fully conscious. Because you are, what you do in meditation is purifying the mind and freeing the mind of emotions. And so the mind calms down and you are aware of the calmness. Hmm? All the agitations due to emotion is simply, I explained, uh, a disturbance of the whole body, not only of the mind. So it's a disturbance of the body. And uh, the way to get rid of that disturbance is to become conscious and to be relaxed. You can consciously relax the body instead of unconsciously and emotionally releasing the tension in action. Now, when you are emotionally excited, like if you are angry, there is tension in the body and the tension makes you uncomfortable. And this discomfort you get rid of by releasing the tension in action. Action of speech or action of body. That is what you call using bad language or abusing people or fighting and quarreling. All that is the action part which is the release of tension, which is done unconsciously. You are not conscious of the release of tension there. You are only conscious of doing something. You are not conscious that you are releasing tension. But when you relax the tension, you are doing it consciously. So it's a conscious act when you relax the tension. You are aware of the tension and you just let go. Now tension is when you hold like that and let go is to let go. That is relaxation. So that you are consciously relaxing. So we have to distinguish between unconscious release of tension and conscious relaxation of tension. These are two different things. So, when we are conscious of the emotion and the tension, then we can learn to relax the tension. Now, some people, when they want to get rid of the emotion, they begin to use another emotion to go against that emotion. That is fighting. That doesn't work. That is what we call asceticism. Asceticism means you are giving discomfort and pain to your body. You are very angry that 
this emotion is there. That is called conquering the flesh or self-mortification. Mortify the flesh. And that is asceticism. But here we are learning to relax and calm the mind. That's a different thing. So this is the middle path shown by the Buddha. Middle path is not to take a little bit of that and little bit of this, but to give up both ways, which is being carried away by the emotion or trying to suppress a fight with the emotion. Instead of doing both, you take the third part, which is learning to purify the mind and relax the body. That is the middle path. So, that middle path is what is called the Noble Eightfold Path. It is called the Noble Eightfold Path because there are eight steps in this process. Eight steps. And the first step is to understand the problem and its solution. We are having a problem. The problem is that the emotions are going against reality. And what is reality? Reality is what is seen by the mental process of thinking. When we begin to think, we are aware of what is going on, which is that everything in this world is dependent on conditions. Everything that happens in the world happens only when the necessary conditions are present. And when the necessary conditions are absent, it ceases to be. For example, if you want a, a flame, you strike a match. That is, you are providing the necessary conditions for a flame to arise. So when you provide the necessary conditions for the flame to arise, the flame comes up. And you blow out the, say it's a candle, you light the candle and then blow out. That means the flame disappears because the necessary conditions are not present. So blowing out is to take away at least one condition. If you take one condition out, it is gone. Huh? So uh, so this is the natural process, the nature, if you want to use the word nature, the nature is this, that everything that arises, arises depending on the presence of the necessary conditions. That is what is called determinism. That determinism is the natural process, which the Buddha called Paticca Samuppada, today translated as uh, dependent origination or something like that. But the better word is determinism itself. Hmm? So the important thing is that our even the mind is working according to this same law 
of determinism. And that means there is no person doing anything. These are mental processes going on depending on the necessary conditions. So when we think, we think we are thinking, that they, but there is no we or I to think. The thinking goes on because of the presence of the necessary conditions. When the necessary conditions are there, the thinking process goes on. When the conditions are absent, it stops. That's how it is. <laughs> so there is no real person doing the thinking. This is what Sigmund Freud pointed out when he used the word psychic determinism. Psychic determinism means that the same law of determinism works in the mind. The mind also behaves according to this principle of determinism. And therefore there is no person doing anything here. But he used the word ego to refer to the thinking. If he didn't believe in a self here, why did he use the word ego? The only reason is that he had read Descartes. Because Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. So the real ego is the thinking process. So what people refer to as myself is ultimately that thinking process. But the thinking process is the activity of the brain. And that activity of the brain starts with Perception, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. When you have perceived something, then you begin to think. Not you, the brain begins to think. And that part of the brain that is responsible for thinking is called the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex. Now, all this necessary research has been done today by the modern scientists, but still every scientist is caught up in this delusion of self. <laughs> that is the problem. <laughs> So although the, the experiments and theories, all that, they have understood. So this is why it is possible to explain these things to the modern scientist. Because the modern scientists who are... But the problem is, in the modern world, Science is also specialized. So that means one scientist know, knows only one part of science. Another scientist will know another part of science. But there is no scientist who knows that whole thing. This is the problem. So as a result, the scientist cannot understand the whole entire truth. This is the problem. So this is why a Buddha becomes necessary to show that the whole picture. It's only when the whole picture is seen that the scientist can become enlightened. But becoming enlightened is not enough. You have to become awakened. So I told you the, about the difference between enlightenment and awakening. So that uh, 
What the Buddha achieved was awakening, not just enlightenment. Hmm. So this is important. So uh, it is the thinking part which we call mano, or in modern psychology is called cognition. Is the thinking part that is aware of reality, but the emotions are not aware of reality. Emotion simply means I want this, I hate this, <coughs> I am frightened, or I am worried. That is all. That is emotion. It's like the child and the mother. The child and the mother are in conflict because the child wants the impossible and the mother says that is impossible, you cannot have that. No, no, I want it. I don't care whether it is impossible or not, I want it. Now that means conflict. So in the same way, we have the child and the mother inside us. The mother is the thinking part and the child is the emotional part. So these two parts come in conflict. So this is the, all the problems in psychology. And uh, it's simply the conflict between the emotions and the thinking, reasoning part. That is what Sigmund Freud pointed out. But you know, during the time of uh, uh, Freud, there was another um, disciple of Freud, Alfred Adler. Now this man saw the thing in a slightly different way. Freud saw that the emotions are coming in conflict with reason. That is the id is coming in conflict with the ego. But This man saw that it was the, the thinking part, the ego, that is coming in conflict with circumstances. He saw it in a slightly different way. Now the Buddha spoke of three things. Loba, dosa, and moha. Loba refers to the desire for pleasure. Dosa refers to the hatred of pain. And moha refers to the thought I am, the self. Now Freud focused on those two things, loba and dosa. And Adler focused on the moha part. This is why Adler saw it as a conflict between the self and the circumstances outside. So the later Freudians began to take the ideas of Adler and they began to think of uh, developing the ego. The ego has to learn to deal with the problems that come up outside the circumstances. This is why the modern Freudians are mainly focusing on uh, developing the ego. Mm -hmm. 
So they speak of uh, self-assertion. You have to learn to assert yourself because the the neurotics they see as people who are not having self-confidence or that they are not able to uh, deal with circumstances, a kind of weakness. That is why they think of the ego, strengthening the ego through self-assertion. Now this is why the modern psychologists, when they go to learn meditation, they are not able to explain why the Buddha talks about giving up the ego, while the psychologists talk about self-assertiveness or developing the ego. So this is a big conflict and some, some, some of these people are writing about this books, in books. And uh, if you read some of those books, you begin to understand that they have not been able to solve the problem properly. But the important thing is to understand that emotions and ego are going on the same line. Freud emphasized the emotions and the, what are called the neo-Freudians emphasize the ego. That's the main thing. So you see, when we get rid of the emotions, the ego automatically goes away because the ego is a emotional feeling, not a rational concept. The self is not a rational concept. It is an emotional feeling. And so when we give up the emotions, and the tension that comes with the emotion, the feeling of self disappears. That means when we have learned to relax the body fully and calm the mind, the feeling of self disappears. This is why even some of these uh, Christian uh, what are called uh, mystics huh? they realize the self disappears they also some of them are able to calm the mind to that point where the mind is purified and they calm the mind. And when they calm the mind, the self disappears. And when the self disappears, they begin to wonder, what happened to myself? <laughs> and they think they have united with God. That's how they get into that illusion because they can't get rid of the idea of God. You see? So the self unites with God. But the thing is, a Buddhist 
who has understood that there is no real self to talk about and rationally understood that and then begins to meditate and purify the mind, then you begin to be confirmed, ah, yes, the self, I felt the self only because of the emotions and the tensions. When the emotions and tensions are gone, I don't feel the self. But later, when the emotions come up again, the self comes back. So they are convinced that there is no real self, but I get the feeling of self when the tensions come up. Then you are convinced that there is no real self. This self is coming from the tensions and the emotions. That is the conviction where the idea of self uh, disappears. And that is what is called a stream entry. One who enters the stream is to realize that there is no self. But that is only the beginning. And now that person is convinced that the important thing is to get rid of these emotions so that not temporarily getting rid of the emotions, but permanently getting rid of the emotions. Because only that temporary uh, ridding of the emotions that convinced him that there is no real self. But when you get back the emotions, you again, you experience the self. So this is why we speak of samadhi. So samadhi is that situation where the mind calms down and the body relaxes and you enter that state where even the feeling of self disappears. So you are aware, that is the first jhana, that is called the first jhana. So, but there are four jhanas, the first jhana, the second jhana, third jhana, and the fourth jhana. Hmm? So, uh, I think uh, we spoke about happiness and the disadvantages of going after sensual pleasures and the advantages of purifying the mind and uh, we are beginning to get into what is called the jhanas, which is done through the proper method of meditation. So, uh, I think for today that is enough. Huh? So, maybe next time we go into more about the meditation and the jhanas. So, now you can ask questions. So, if there is no I in the thinking part, why is there an I in the emotional part? So is there a self only in one part of you? He said, because originally we were saying that there is no self. So why is there a self when you are thinking and you said thinking just goes on? There is no self. 
There's nobody doing the thinking. Mm -hmm. I am not doing the thinking. Mm -hmm. Right? My brain, my neurons are all firing up and they're doing the thinking. But what then causes this emotion you're saying is still self. But why is it then that self is not there when you're thinking and it's there when you're feeling? What is this thing that is absent at one time and present at another time? Because the emotions are self-centered. All emotions are self-centered. What does that mean? When you desire something, you say, I want this. So a desire is self-centered, thinking of the self. Because you personalize the desire, that means this desire is mine. So when the desire comes up, you are personalizing the desire and you see two things. What you desire is outside, the desire is inside. And what is inside is mine. What is outside is not mine. That is how this desire starts the idea of self. You see, so the emotion is always like that. It's all not only desire, I hate. The hatred is also doing the same thing. You personalize the hatred and alienate the object. And then uh, so that is the idea of existence. The self. The self is based on the emotion and not on reason. When you begin to reason out, because I said existence itself is a static concept in a dynamic reality. So there is no, not, nothing static to call a self. Because self is a static concept, because it is not changing. Past, present and future. The self is present in the past, present and the future. That is existence. But, so rationally you see that there is no real self to talk about. But, emotionally you feel the self. That is a problem. So that is why it is an emotional feeling, not a rational concept. And the Buddha himself, did he talk about the self? He did not, right? He tried not to talk about self when he was questioned. Um, no, he t talks about the self. There is a man who came and asked him, is there a self? He was silent. Then he asked, is there no self? Then he was silent. Is there both self and no self? Then he was silent. Again. Is there neither self nor no self? And he was silent. So this man thought he doesn't like to speak to me and he went away. <laughs> so the Buddha's disciple Ananda asked the Buddha, why didn't you answer that question? He said, if I said, yes, there is a self, Then I am speaking against what I have already said. All experience is impersonal. Sabbe Dhamma Anatta means all experience is impersonal. And then 
if I if I said there is no self, he might think I have been having a self all these days and now I have no self so that I will not be reborn again. What is the I that he is talking about if there is no self? Because, you see, because he is thinking of a self and when the person dies, he is not reborn again if there is no self to be reborn. So that means he is going on the wrong track. He doesn't think of a, that this self is derived from the emotions and not just from reason. Because they cannot give up the idea of self, even if you are convinced uh, there is no self. Then they ask, then when I die, I will not be born again. What does that mean? If there is no self, who is the I that is talking about? So they cannot get out of the idea of I. Even if you are convinced that there is no self, or oh, then I must think that there is no self. Then what is the I that is? <laughs> the I doesn't disappear. It's like that. So that's what we know. When you say about the necessary conditions, yeah. the candle, the flame and everything, you said that the, the thinking is started. No, thinking part can be, can understand that there is no self. But the emotional part cannot understand anything. There is no understanding for the emotions. Emotions are only wanting or not wanting. There is no such thing as understanding for the emotions. All understanding is done by the thinking part. And the thinking part is the activity of the brain. Emotion is not the activity of the brain. It is the activity of the whole body when the blood begins to uh, change due to hormones being secreted into the blood and this being carrying carried to the various parts of the body and changes taking place in the activities of the body. So it's a completely physical thing, what we call the emotion. It's not a mental thing. You mentioned the middle path. Um, and then you talk about the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, you mentioned the first, understand the problem. Will we talk about the rest? There are eight steps. Samaditti. You should learn the Pali words, otherwise uh, if you begin to translate and depend only on the translation, sometimes the translation doesn't give the meaning properly. So, Samma Ditti, Samma Sankappa, Samma Vacha, Samma Kamant, Samma Ajiva, Samma Vayama, Samma Sati, Samma Samadhi. Those are eight steps. Now, Samma Ditti means you are using the thinking part to understand the problem and its solution. That is Samaditi. So, uh, so the important thing is to understand this and uh, so the harmonious perspective means you have to understand uh, a perspective means to see, to see it from a different angle. Now, when you take a picture, you, you have to 
hold the camera in such a way that you see it from a certain angle. So that is why I use the word perspective. It's not a different uh, idea or something like that. It is a different way of looking at life, harmonious perspective. And uh, after that comes the harmonious visualization. That visualization is how you imagine. That means you are imagining the goal. I also call it the goal orientation. The harmonious goal orientation. That means your life. You are changing your goal in life. And what is that goal? To be free from emotions that it becomes your goal. So your goal in life is a goal where you are free from emotions. But you have only changed your goal in life. And when the goal is changed, your behavior automatically changes. Now, you see, people are in a, a habit, say, like drinking or smoking or some habit like that. How you find it very difficult to get rid of the habit. Why is this? That habit is based on a goal. You may not even know what the goal is. So it, that goal is unconscious. So if you can discover the goal, why am I smoking? What, is the, what am I expecting? What is my goal? There must be some reason why I smoke. Then you begin to understand the goal, then you change that goal. Now, for example, uh, a young man or woman uh, takes to smoking. Why? Because that person sees uh, film stars or some uh, people, they uh, appreciate their smoking. Oh, I also want to be like that. And then smoking becomes a way of becoming superior or strong. Or oh, you might think of oh, the strong men as people who smoke. So I also want to become strong like that. So that is, you are having a goal in life. Now, supposing this person is uh, in the habit of smoking and then thinks of uh, building the body, bodybuilding uh, with muscle, muscular, I want to have a muscular body. And you go to uh, some person who is teaching how to build the body, and the teacher says, well, if you want to build the body, you have to give up smoking. Now his goal is to be build the body. Automatically the smoking disappears. That, because the goal has changed. So like that, by changing the goal, First, you have to understand what your goal is. And by changing the goal, you change your way of living altogether. And that is, you change your speech, your action, and your lifestyle. I call it the lifestyle because this idea of goal-seeking and uh, this is, comes from Alfred Adler. 
and he was talking about this and he was also uh, talking about the goal and uh, goal orientation his psychotherapy was uh, connected with that way of thinking and this is also the meaning of this noble eightfold path where the goal is changed and that is the samma sankap this way i translate it also as a harmonious goal orientation and uh, that results in harmonious speech harmonious action and harmonious lifestyle now lifestyle because some people translate this as the occupation we are not talking about any occupation we are talking about changing your lifestyle completely you are not only once in a way speaking good words or once in a way doing good actions this is changing your whole way of living because your goal has changed so your whole lifestyle has changed but that is only in terms of behavior but still you may be having the desire for pleasure and the hatred of pain and things like that so the next step is to learn to get rid of that that is the right exercise the harmonious pers- exercise so that just as you practice some exercise to build your body now you are practicing these exercises to uh, purify the mind to free the mind of emotions and that exercise has four parts samvara pahana bhavana and anurakkhana so the first thing supposing uh, you want to grow flowers in a garden what is the first thing that you do prepare the soil uh and then you plant the seeds and then after that what do you do you have to water it regularly and put the whatever pick away all uh, uh, other plants ha huh? it might start growing so that in the same way we are going to purify the mind means you have to prevent bad thoughts coming into the mind to prevent bad thoughts coming into the mind you have to find out where from where are the bad thoughts coming the bad thoughts come into the mind through the senses from what you see what you hear what you smell what you taste what you touch so this is called guarding the senses so that is the way you prevent bad thoughts entering the mind because last time we said that these emotions are not built into the system starting from inside and seeking an outlet outside emotions are starting from outside and coming in it is flowing in and it starts with perception seeing hearing smelling tasting touching so this is why the perception is done through the senses and you are guarding the senses that means when you guard your eyes your ears your nose your tongue your body 
and that means when you see something you don't think about the pleasantness or the unpleasantness when you hear something you don't think about the pleasantness or unpleasant when you smell something you don't think about the pleasantness or unpleasantness like that you guard all the senses and uh, elimination means if a bad thought is already there in your mind you must learn how to get rid of it when a bad thought is already there in your mind how is it present in the mind what does that mean unconscious no no it means that there is an image in your mind there is a picture in your mind if you are angry you, you have a picture of that person who made you angry who did something to you or if you are in love or something like that then you have the picture of that person you are in love with huh so it's always the picture in the mind and now to get rid of that you have to get rid of the picture so you can change the picture it's a matter of changing taking another picture in your mind if it is about the anger you take a picture in your mind of a friend of yours or you can even telephone your friend or write a letter to your friend or you uh, go and meet the friend or you invite the friend to come to see you so that way you change this is what we psychologists do when they call it counseling or something you are going to meet the uh, counselor and then you speak about your problem that is you are change in the picture now mothers know how when a baby is crying what does the mother do the mother will carry the baby and then show oh, look at this this is a nice picture here that change in the picture in the mind you see we have to learn to change the picture in the mind it's like uh, changing channels on tv huh press the button and the different picture comes up so like that that is the elimination that is how you eliminate a thought that is already there in the mind even though a pleasant uh, uh, a pleasant image which what pleasant images eva ankara mogada pleasant lassan devulu ankara mogada yeah whether pleasant or unpleasant you are getting, uh, removing that if it is an unpleasant image you are having a bad emotion and uh, if it is a pleasant image you think it is a good image but it may be it's a bad image because it is producing bad emotions if you want to get rid of a desire for something then you have to get rid of it if you keep thinking it is a good emotion then it will stay with you you see now for example you want to break your love for a person then take the image of although you think it is good to have this image in the mind or take a picture and you take pictures when you are in love with some person you take picture of that person hang on your wall or keep on the table now that itself has to be removed in the wall huh if you want to get rid of it <laughs> so that is the important thing these pictures are the things that uh, keep emotions in your mind 
So the emotions are all based on pictures. That is why this visualization is important, that visualizing the goal. And that is, there is that book called Secret. Have you read that book called Secret? The secret, yeah. If you read that book, that is also talking about the same thing. Have the image in your mind of what you want to be, or what you want to do, and then you'll have it. And that is what we do when we worship the Buddha, is also having the image of the Buddha, that is what you want to be. Buddha becomes your goal, and so visualize it. That's the important thing there. So, uh, that is, those are the two things, uh, Sangvara and Pahana. Sangvara is prevention, Pahana is uh, getting rid of what is already there. Now that is like preparing the ground to plant the seeds. And now the next step is to plant the seed, that is the cultivation. And how do you plant the seed? Now, if you have understood the importance of uh, the pictures, the plant, the seed is to hold the proper picture in the mind. Huh? The, again, it is the picture that is important. That is the right visualization. And, uh, but here, one important thing, uh, no, I'm not going into details, if I go into details again, problem. Uh, uh, what are the things you want to get rid of? Now, when you practice this, these two things, what you want to get rid of is all the bad thoughts. And bad thoughts are what are called the hindrances. Pancha Nivarana, five hindrances. And uh, these are Kama Chanda Vyapada Tinamid Uddacha Kukkucha Vichikicha. Kama Chanda means the desire for sensual pleasures. Vyapada means anger. Tina Midda means laziness or drowsiness. Uh, Uddacha Kukkucha means anxieties and worries. Worries and anxieties. And Vichigicca is where your mind is divided into two. Hmm? The emotions and reason going in opposite directions. That is the Vichigicca. Not doubt. Some people translate it as doubt. This has nothing to do with doubt. Doubt is to question, is it true or is it false? That is doubt. But here, Vichikicca is what is called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance means your mind is divided into two. Say you are supposed to be practicing the five precepts and uh, you are not supposed to be drinking alcohol. Now your mind is now divided. Shall I take this drink or shall I not? That is the Vichikicca. So that you, you come to a point where you are not able to make a decision 
Oh, you see some money, no one is around. You have some big amount of money someplace. Shall I take this or not? <laughs> if you take it, you are stealing. If you are not, then you are good. So this is the important thing. So this is the difference between the emotion and your reason. Are you being carried away by the emotion or are you being carried away by the reason? That is the vichikicca. So it is not a matter of doubt, it's a matter of indecision. Like. Hmm? Seven factors of enlightenment in Pali. Seven factors of enlightenment in Pali. Panchani uh, Varana? No, no, Bojanga. Bojanga. Ah, enlightenment. Oh, Bojanga is not uh, seven factors of enlightenment. Bojanga is seven steps in the process of awakening. Seven steps in the process of awakening. Not just, uh, so my translations are different because it How do you say the seven gives the meaning life? out properly. These are seven steps in the process of awakening. Now cultivating that, seven steps in the process of awakening is the real meaning of vipassana. And... Uh, the first two things, Sangmara and Pahana, is uh, what is called Samatha meditation, Samatha Bhavana. So this way, and then Samma Sati. Samma Sati is really, now you are beginning to practice the vipassana part which is to change the way you think. I said the way you think determines your emotion and that determines your action. So now you are changing the way you think and uh, that is this whole process of awakening is to change the way you think. You are awakening from the dream of existence. Now we'll be discussing this, these things in more detail later. So this is simply talking about the Noble Eightfold Path. And, but that is, the last one is Samma Samadhi. And Samma Samadhi is the purity of mind, which is also the tranquility of mind, which is the harmonious equilibrium. <clears throat> 